Awesome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another shadowing session with Fresh Central Shadowing. Today, we have Dr. Redman, who is an uh, endodontist resident. And so through this presentation, she'll like tell us a little bit about herself and her background and we'll learn a little bit more. So uh, pass it on to you. Thank you. Okay. Well, first step, get this to work. Okay. Hi, I am Jess. Uh, I rarely go by doctor. I will sometimes, if I think my patient is judging me for looking young, I will say doctor, but really, um, I don't really require it. My dad is a dentist and he still goes by his first name to patients. So I sort of got in that habit. Um, but definitely if you feel like a patient while you're young, it's important to have some title. So I guess I'll be Dr. Jess Redmond for this presentation. Um, I am a current second year endodontic resident at Texas A&M. It used to be Baylor, in case any of you are familiar. Um, endodontic programs, which I'll get into, range from either two years or they can be three years, and they can also be 27 months. So mine is 27 months, so it's two years and three months. Um, so I'll be graduating this September, and it's in Dallas, Texas. I am not from there, um, but I love it here, and as you'll learn, I am going to stay here indefinitely. Okay, so what will we just be discussed? Um, I put a list here, but I'm going to sort of wing it. And I don't know how many of you are watching live. I do have a poll just to kind of see your background. And based on that, I might adapt. But these are some things we're going to go over. My background, what is anodonics, um, how to pursue anodonic residency, any advice I have, and then just a little bit more about what inspires me and why I like endo. And then, of course, we'll have questions. Okay, so something that is super important, even just like applying to dental school, is having a, an eye on the big picture. So it's so easy to get wrapped up, even in, like you apply to college, then you go through college and you're busy, and then you apply to dental school. Then you have interviews, then you get into dental school and you're so focused that you're, and you're studying, and then you some of you might apply to residency or you might apply to jobs. Um, but it's really important to remember why you are pursuing this um, either specialty or this path, this career path. So I would just urge you, I know it's so hard, but even when you're studying for like your worst test, just try to like take a step back and remember why you're there. Um, you will maybe have moments of doubt or, you know, feel like it's really hard and that will really help you. So these are some things that I kind of keep in mind. So patients have a lot of fear and anxiety associated with the dentist, especially with root canals. Um, no one wants a root canal, several movies. I mean, they just say, you know, anything's better than a root canal, things like that. A lot of my patients fall asleep or after are smiling or say it wasn't that bad. So that to me is a huge deal. And I like being like a friendly face that doesn't make them scared. Um, also endodontists, I'll get into a little bit, but we have to do, we deal with trauma sometimes. So chip front teeth. Um, and also sometimes your nerve can die and you won't know about it. And it presents um, like a darkened tooth and we have ways to treat it through bleaching inside the tooth. Sort of complicated, but again, and that top uh, right or left, I'm so used to seeing x-rays where it's background, top left picture um, where that one front tooth is discolored, that, of course, fixing that would make a big impact on someone's life. So I try to remember this even on the really hard days, and it does help. Okay, so I'm not sure if anyone is here, but I want to just take a poll just in case people are here, just so I know sort of how to cater this. I also hate typos, and I'm so sorry there's a typo in B. So if you're here... Um, and it's okay if no one's here. I'll just talk to myself. Um, but just test, text Jess Ashley 653. Um, no, wait. Text. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Text Jess Ashley 653 to this number. And it will pop up if anyone's responding. I'll just give it like 30 seconds. And if not, we'll just move on. Okay, that's okay. Um, I have two more. And honestly, I don't even know if it was going to work. So I'm, I'm not too upset. But okay. So back to me. Um, so I, I went to high school um, in Rhode Island, I was a swimmer. And then I applied to several schools and sort of made my choice, mostly on location, class size, and also where I could swim. Um, Trinity College is in Hartford, Connecticut which is like a little under two hours from where I'm from in Rhode Island. And I also was a beach lifeguard where I'm from. Um, and one of my 
older friends I used to lifeguard with went to this college. So I went and uh, within like, I mean, an hour of being there, I knew it was for me. So love this school. Um, something else cool that, I mean, may, I think it's cool. I don't know if you will, but um, I actually didn't major in science or any, I mean, anything in pre-dental. I actually majored in classical studies, which is essentially like Greek mythology and Greek language um, and things like that. I don't know if it's too late. I don't know what stage you guys are at, but I would, I don't think you have to major in something else. I mean, that was like a little risky. Thank God I got in. Um, but I don't think it's a bad thing. If you can to take other classes, you will take basically the same thing a hundred different times. I have learned like the cells. I mean, just you learn the same things. You can only, biology is only so different. So yes, you have to take those biology and science classes, but you don't have to major in them necessarily. Um, and you also can take other things that I, I will put that in. Actually, we'll talk about it later in my advice. And something else um, crazy, there was under 2,000 people in my school, which was, I actually loved it. Um, I like small schools. So yeah, you can tell I love it the way I talk about it. And then for dental school, I went literally like five minutes down the road to the University of Connecticut. Um, the dental school is not the same as same location as the college, if any of you are familiar, it's not the same campus. Um, but yeah, these are some pictures. I look very different, youthful. Um, yeah, more life in me. But some things just, I mean, to think about when you're applying to dental school, cost is the number one. I mean, it's four years of school. You're not going to work. So, I mean, that's a lot of money. If you're going to do more residency, most likely if you do endo, um, you'll pay. I pay very little, but some schools are really expensive. Other residencies, like if you do a GPR or something like that later, um, it's they'll pay you, but overall, it's just at least four years of not making money. So cheap is huge. My school was also pass fail, which means I never saw any grades. We didn't have a class rank. Um, that is, I think it's just a pro. A lot of people ask me, or when I was applying, they, they would say to me, how are they going to know like that you're even like a good student? Like you don't have a class rank. And I was like, okay, well, I mean, I hope they know. And I mean, they, they either knew or didn't care. I don't know. Um, but this basically made it so all my classmates and I shared notes. There was never competition. I mean, you, th things go on in dental school, just like they do in college. I mean, cheating, things like that, that, I mean, when it's pass fail, it at least limits it. I was oblivious to it. It makes a much better environment. Um, and you get a lot closer with your classmates and you also can maybe go get the extra hour of sleep. If you know, you're going to get a B versus an A, it doesn't really matter. So that was huge. I don't know how many schools have that, but that's something to look look at. Um, again, the small class size, I just think it's great because your faculty know your name. Um, they know more than your name. They, they know things about you. They know, I mean, things that they can speak to on letters of recommendation, which I think are huge when applying. Um, so that's a huge, that's a big thing to think about who are going to write your letters of recommendation. Are they going to just see you as another student or are they going to really know you and have like spent extra time outside of school with you? Also, it was close to my hometown. Um, dental school can be lonely, just like anything else. And like having any sort of support system is good. For me, it was my friends and family in Rhode Island, but I also, I mean, I had friends in Connecticut, so that was good too. Something else, um, I don't know how many, I don't really know enough about all the other dental schools, but some dental schools don't have all the residency programs. So I know, for example, a school doesn't have an endo program. So that means on the downside, you can't shadow the residents. On the plus side, you get to have more complex cases because there's no residents to do those cases. Um, and if this is all confusing, I will cover it. But basically, there's pros and cons to both, and it's good to maybe just know. And then maybe at the end of this presentation, you can look back, um, I guess, at, at why you should ask that question. And on the left is me running a half marathon, which is so insane because now if I tried to run even one mile, I would pass out. So I like to just look at that picture and remember I used to be fit. Um, so this is kind of continuing, just some things about dental school I wish I knew before applying. So dental school is four years. That is a lot. And you can still get out of four years and not feel comfortable going to work right away. That's just the reality. For me, I would not have felt comfortable graduating and going to work. That being said, I did graduate during the pandemic. So I basically stopped, I think, like March, and I lost like four March, April, May, June, I don't know, three months maybe of like your D4 year, which is a big clinic year. But still, um, like that's a that's a big problem. You're there for four years. You want to graduate confident. 
So ways to find out if that's going to be the case, you can ask um, students at these dental schools how they feel their clinical experience is. It is better, in my opinion, to ask a D4. If you catch a D3 who maybe just started or who is swamped with tests, they may give you an answer that really is not as true to a D4. I went through it. I thought the same thing. Um, both opinions are valid, but really the D4 has been there longer and they can truly tell you, I feel comfortable. I'm going to graduate in a few months. I'm ready to go versus the D3 who's still learning and might not be as confident, even though they will later get that experience. So again, de definitely just ask them. You can just ask, do you feel comfortable um, going to work when you graduate and see what they say? Another way to kind of get an answer to this question is you can ask when you're at these interviews, um, how many people work immediately after graduating versus doing a residency? This is very telling. Um, I love UConn, but the majority of us, if not all of us, did a residency. And a residency doesn't mean you specialize necessarily. It, you can do just extra training as a general dentist. It's a GPR or an AGD. Um, and that's one year is nothing, nothing really compared to a lot of other programs. But if everyone from a dental school is doing that one extra year, that tells you something. It doesn't mean you shouldn't go there. I'm happy I went to UConn. I saved a ton of money. And as you saw, I really loved it. But that's something to know before you go. I mean, I didn't mean to rhyme, but something to know before you go. Definitely just ask. Um, I already talked about this. Kind of find out if the school that you're looking at has all the residency programs, especially if you are considering doing that residency program. If you, if you know for sure you're going to be a general dentist, maybe going to a school that doesn't have certain residency programs like endo would allow you to do more root canals and more complex ones. And that could be um, something really beneficial to know. I already said this, but money is, you know, like the most important thing besides happiness. So definitely figure that out. If you, I mean, there's some very expensive schools plus the cost of living, um, just insane. So keep that in mind. We will sacrifice anything to be dentists, but just understand what you're paying um, and how long it will take to pay it back. Something else that I don't know how big of a problem this is, but sometimes you're leaving late, just like you do college and you wanna make sure you feel safe. So if you're walking home alone, um, like, yeah, do you feel safe? So most places I'm sure have some sort of uh, security, but if you're in a city, keep that in mind. Are you someone who's never been in the city? Are you gonna feel comfortable leaving even at like eight or nine o'clock when it's dark out? Um, Cause those are the little things that actually like matter. Also opportunities for leadership and extracurricular activities. I went to a small school, like I said, so there was tons of opportunities. Um, and I think, I mean, that was one, I love doing that, but also it's helpful for your application when you apply to residency. And also it helps you meet the faculty and get closer with them for letters of recommendation. And then also kind of what I said earlier, you will, are going to learn everything you need to know in dental school. You're gonna learn it when you study for the DAT, you're gonna learn it in college, probably learn it a little in high school. You will learn the same things over and over. You'll forget them. You'll relearn them. I would say if you can, take some extra classes in college that are so different that could help you but aren't so sciencey. So you can take an art class. Um, I'm doing endo, so I don't think I'm very artistic. But if you're doing general dentistry and you like that, take an art class. Um, I wish I had take a taken a finance or business class. I literally know nothing. Um, you learn in dental school, but it's really not enough. Um, so yeah, that's one of my big regrets. So I would highly recommend something, if you can, any education in finance or business, even just like a one, I mean, I don't know if they have just a night class or something, that's one of my biggest um, things I wish I could have done. Okay, so I just put this in here, I guess, to see if you guys, I'm gonna have some x-rays and I wanted to see how familiar you guys are. Because you're not here, I'm just gonna leave it and you can sort of quiz yourself um, just because it's here. But basically, this is why I get so confused when I look at anything. When we look at an x-ray, we are looking at the patient's left and the patient's right. It is not your left and right. So I'm looking at my computer screen, and I'm looking at my left, but it's the patient's right. So where it says the word right, that's my left. But in my head, I automatically flip it because all I do is look at x-rays. So you have to just flip it in your head. Um, I think some people do it more naturally, but I basically, anytime I see the left side, I just think right. And when I'm not doing dentistry, it's a, it's a problem, as you can see. But luckily, it's all I do, really. So so this was, let's see. Oh, this is another thing. Um, teeth numbers. I, again, I don't know if you guys know this. And you'll learn it. And honestly, it's one of those things in dental school you think is sort of hard. Um, I used to make flashcards because I wanted to be able to do it really fast. 
now I know them with that, like I could have my eyes closed and, and do it. So it's something that comes with practice. I mean, the sooner you get it, the easier it will be, but it's not something to stress about. It will come so, so easy. There's not enough teeth types or teeth. Um, and this is the, I don't even know the name of this numbering system. I think it's just the universal, but there's other number numbering systems. If you Google things based on quadrants. So just pay attention to that. This is how, if you're in the US that we'll do it. I, okay, so like I was saying, we have quadrants. So if you split the, the mouth in four different top and the bottom, um, those are your four quadrants. And you just say like upper right is this top, top one. So, so then I put these practice in here and I'll just pause. So if you're just doing this um, even later, you have a second to think about it. Yeah. I threw this in here to kind of trick you. This is an edentulous patient or mostly edentulous or some like impacted canines going on, but just to kind of make it something different, but the quadrants um, stay the same, of course. And then, so this is a panoramic image on the left, on my left. And then on the right, I showed you what it looks like in a PA, which is a periapical image. Um, and you don't have any other information here, like in the other, in the pan, you can tell all the teeth, so it's easy to pick the quadrant. But here, it's by themselves. So you sort of have to learn um, the teeth types and you'll learn you know, if molars are on, if it goes molar, molar, premolar, then you're more likely on the patient's right. I know that's very confusing and over your head, maybe over your head, I'm not sure. It would be over my head. Um, you can see I still get confused with left and rights, but just something to practice and be aware of, really not important. Um, I'll kind of walk us through the x-rays the rest of the presentation, so it's okay. Okay, so a little bit about endodontics. So basically, endodontics is the branch of dentistry concerned with the human dental pulp and the periradicular tissues. So the pulp is, I don't know if my pointer is going to work. I doubt it, it maybe is. We'll see. I can I see. Know. You can see the pointer? Okay. Yeah. So it's this dark line in the middle of the tooth. Um, I'm, not even, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with x-rays, but basically this top part is the crown and this is the root. And then this is the canal. So this is where we do all our work. What's inside the canal is the pulp and the pulp contains blood vessels, nerves, other things. Um, and then at the end, we call it the periradicular tissues or periapical tissues. Basically, this is the apex of the tooth. So anything around the apex would be like peri means around, so periapical, and another way they, that people say is periradicular. So this is our basically the area we live. Um, something I'll show you when we go through x-rays, a lot of um, just the basic way you know it's a root canal problem is if you see this dark circle at the end of the root, it's called a radiolucency because it's, it's black. Um, if it was white, like these fillings down here, these are amalgam fillings, that's radio-opaque. Um, so yeah, we call it just, a, uh, I'm blanking. Um, and then it's at the, it's at the apex. So we call it a periapical radiolucency and we abbreviate it PARL, P-A-R-L. So just, just not that you need to know it, but just in case you've seen it, periapical radiolucency, PARL, basically there's just like this black circle at the end of the root. And it doesn't always mean it's an endo pro problem, but for this stage of learning, I mean, basically, yes, it is. Okay, so endodontists do a few procedures. The reason, one of the reasons why I did it was because it's very few procedures and I am very much the type, I wanna be very good at what I do. I mean, not necessarily very quickly, um, but if I have to learn how to do, perfect 10 procedures versus three procedures, it's gonna take me less time to perfect three. So that's why I love it. One reason I love endodont uh, endodontics. Um, root canal is basically our main procedure. Retreatment is basically if the patient has a root canal already and bacteria get back in or there's some sort of other problem and we have to redo the root canal. So we just call it retreatment. We also do a surgery that basically involves cutting the end of the root. So in this x-ray, sometimes for us to do the surgery, this tooth would already have a root canal. And for some reason, we can't clean it out from this direction. So we have to go in this direction. It's That's basically it. Um, and we have some other miscellaneous procedures. Um, we'll just skip it, but if you want to look them up, they're very interesting. Um, I don't know how common they are. When people do them. They're sort of, some of them, incision, incision and drainage is an emergency procedure. Many, I mean, general dentists will do this. 
but the intentional replantation and auto transplantation are sort of last resorts that we can offer, offer to our patients if implants aren't an option um, or things like that. So it's something to look up if you're interested, but do not really worry about them. Okay, so what is a root canal? I'm going to play this video and then we'll go back. I just think they do a better job than me. Uh, let me see. Let me try one thing, then I will just give up. I'm not someone who tries like a hundred times. Uh, let's just see if it works. Okay, that's fine. I will guess I'll just have to explain it. So basically, let's start with this last left image. Like one of the tooth, the way on top is enamel, below it is dentin, and then inside this red, that is the pulp. So not I'm not gonna get too complicated, but basically we use the term vital and necrotic when we talk about the pulp. So vital means the pulp is still alive and necrotic mean it, means it is dead. If it is um, vital or alive, it does not have bacteria in it. So it is not infected, it is inflamed. If the, the nerve is, if the pulp is dead um, or necrotic, then bacteria can get inside and we call it infected. Really not a big deal, but like here it says infected tooth, which probably, because I have see a little abscess, but don't think that a tooth has to be infected when you need a root canal. And also patients will sometimes ask, like, do I have an infection? Really, no, not always. And even if in the cases that you do, it's a localized infection. Again, I'm probably going too much, but just these are things that, I mean, come up all the time. Infection is kind of a scary word. It, it makes you think antibiotics, makes you think immediate treatment. A lot of teeth we treat are not infected. So we make a, an opening in the tooth. We remove the cavity that was here on the left. And we basically make the opening to let us get into the nerve. We then use instruments called files to clean out. I keep saying nerve. Um, it's the pulp. It's more than just nerves, but I'm just used to explaining patients that way. I'm just going to keep doing that. Um, there are other things in the pulp, but again, it's just easier for patients to say nerve. So that's how I talk. Um, so you clean out the nerve with a file. You also use irrigants, which are basically liquids that help um, kill bacteria and do other, they perform other functions. Uh, but they they help a lot and then once we have removed and cleaned and disinfected when it's an infected tooth um, we put a filling in called gutta percha and it's this pink thing down here and then sometimes we do a what's called a post um, i'm going to skip it for now i might talk about it later and then we either place a temporary filling on top if our general dentist wants to wants to place the filling themselves or place a permanent filling so basically in summary we are just cleaning out a nerve that either got inflamed because of a cavity um, or a trauma or something, or it's infected because maybe the cavity has been there so long or the cavity is so big. Um, either way, we clean it out and then we fill it, basically fill it up with gutta percha. So hopefully I explained it. This link might work later. If you just Google, um, like use the AAE website, that's the best resource. AAE, what is a root canal? That video, I think like start at three minutes, it's pretty good. I don't, I usually don't even like videos, but that one was, it was helpful. Okay, so a few things. How do we know a patient needs a root canal now that we know what it is? So I kind of talked about it. Basically, you can need a root canal for different reasons, but most likely what we hear about is because a patient's in pain. Not always the case, but let's just say for this purpose, yes. So these are some questions just we ask patients just to learn more about them or learn more about their pain. So um, if you ask a patient, how bad is the pain? That can kind of tell you if it's a root canal problem. Also, if you ask them, I don't think it's even on here, but do you have sensitivity to cold? And if they say, yeah, yeah, when I drink something cold, um, even when the cold is like out of my mouth, I'm done drinking, it still is very sensitive for a couple minutes. That is an indication that the, the pulp might be inflamed. If they say, yeah, I have a sip of water, it's really, really sensitive, but it's gone within a few seconds, that's actually normal. Um, so you can ask really specific questions. You don't want to ask just, are you sensitive to cold? You have to kind of know these deeper questions. I'm not going to keep going. I feel like this is really in depth, but it just shows you how we use really specific questions to get the information we want. Another, I will, I mean, I just said I wouldn't keep going, but I love this. I'm going to do one more. Um, asking patients to describe the pain really helps. So if they say it's a really sharp pain, uh, maybe a sharp pain on biting, Yes, it can maybe be something that could lead to a root canal, but really not typically. When we think root canal, we think dull, we think aching, and we think throbbing. 
So kind of learning those keywords helps. If you guys are shadowing, um, this is something to pay attention to. What is the dentist asking the patient? Um, and maybe like even bring up some of these questions that they hadn't hadn't asked. Of course, don't just ask the patient a question. Ask the dentist or get the dentist permission. But just, I mean, just show that you know something is, is always good. Okay, and this is one of the main reasons I went into endo. An endodontist is a detective, truly. We have to use clues. We use those questions I just talked about. Um, and we use tests to tell us what is going on. So one of the main tools we use is called Endoice. Like you guys just heard me talking about, cold is a, it helps us learn um, how the, the status of the pulp, if it's inflamed or if the tooth is dead. So basically, or the, the pulp is dead. Um, cold, most of the time you can say the pulp is dead or necrotic. There are patients who are way older. If you test all of their teeth with cold, you will never get a response. That's just part of the aging process. That does not mean they need a root canal on every tooth. But as we're learning basics, just think when you use this endo ice, it's, it's a spray, you put it on a little piece of cotton. If you put it on the tooth for let's say 15 to 30 seconds and the patient does not feel anything, but you put it on the next tooth over and they jump within five seconds, that tells you something and that basically can give you the go ahead. That is basically a root canal problem and the patient needs a root canal. Something else just to, you know, overcomplicate it, but you want to test at least one tooth next to it and also tooth on the other side and tooth below because some of these teeth um, can, can give you a false response. So moral of the story is this endo ice, most of the time, no response means um, the tooth is dead, but again, just use I just want to basically say this as an insurance policy. You have to test several other teeth just to make sure that the patient has a normal response. I know that was confusing, but I, you won't be able to sleep at night if I tell you guys to do root canals when you don't get a response. Um, another thing we test is called percussion sensitivity. You basically tap on the, the cusp tip or the occlusal plane of the tooth, basically the biting surface with a mirror handle. Again, you have to test other teeth as well. But if it is a tooth with a really, um, we call it apical periodontitis. It's that radiolucency, or basically the progression has spread into that periapical tissues. Remember that circle in the bone? Um, then they might have sensitivity when you tap. So that's another clue that we use. Um, we also use this thing called a tooth sleuth. Um, really not super important now as you're learning, but it's just some, a tool we use. And then also there's this little bump on the gums. Some patients will have this. They'll say they notice a pimple on their gums or they notice a bad taste in their mouth. It's called a sinus tract. I have a picture very soon that shows actually we can put something in there. We put gutta percha in there front to, the, to the gums, um, the gingiva, and we put it through the sinus tract and it actually connects to the tooth. And I hope I have it. I have it on the next slide, if not this one. It's very cool. Um, this was just something, again, it's kind of overkill, but just how I was saying um, or how that other picture was showing that post. A post basically is something you put in the root canal and the filling will wrap around it. So on this left side, the tooth has been crown prepped. That's why it looks so tiny. And on this right image, you see this pink is the gutta percha, that root canal filling. We remove some of the gutta percha to make space for this post. In the image over here, it's metal. In this, it's, it's fiber. Most likely, I, I only really use fiber, but in dental school, you'll use both essentially just something to stick out of the tooth that then lets you build up. Um, you have basically more height, more structure to build up your um, prep, your crown prep or your filling. So you can see in this next picture that you really can't see through it, but the post is inside that actually. They can just cut it down a little bit um, and it helps the tooth that otherwise would be too small and might not be able to be saved. So another way that we can use root canals the tooth doesn't have to be infected or inflamed or even be causing the patient pain. But maybe there's just so much missing because of a cavity that you have to do a root canal to be able to put this post in. Again, everything I do is overkill, um, but I like to be uh, complete. So I just threw this in here. Okay, so this was the cool picture I, I wanted to show you. So probably maybe gross. I'm not sure if you guys, I, I don't think it's gross. But basically, there's a little bump on the gum up here. We can stick gutta percha in, and the reason we do that is we have it, it's basically, it's not sterile, but it's, um, I mean, as clean as it gets. And you can see it actually, this is the gutta percha. It's coming like right from outside. And this actually, we can see it, it's going right to the apex of the tooth. It's a connection from the outside to the inside. It's actually your body's way of helping you 
or helping whatever your patient establish a pathway of drainage. Um, if all that drainage has nowhere to nowhere to go, um, you'll get a swelling like this patient has on the right. And the, the sinus tract is actually allowing that pressure relief and preventing swelling. So mostly in patients with sinus tracts, you will not have swelling and you won't really even have pain a lot of the time. Um, so that's actually like a really, I say the bubble on the gums um, is a really big sign. This, this uh, swelling, it's hard to always catch these because sometimes you're on the side of your patient, but it's important when your patient comes in or if you're shadowing, you see a patient, look at the patient straight on if you can, because then you can really see those asymmetries. So this is the same patient. It's really hard to, you really, even I can't really see it in this picture, but there is a swelling um, in the gums here, it's in the vestibule. And then also in this bottom picture is the same patient. Remember, we see that black circle at the bottom, the periapical radiolucency, and that's what's what's going on in this patient. She has a, this deep amalgam filling. We know it's amalgam um, because it's radio opaque. It's so close to the nerve. So either it, when they put the filling in, it exposed the nerve, or maybe over time it leaked. Somehow bacteria, or bacteria eventually got into this space and the body's response is to wall off that infection. So they, they create this black circle, which is bone loss. So it's walling off the infection. So these are all ways that your body actually is helping you. Other things, so uh, endodontists really, we live off the x-ray. And I, again, I don't really know, I wish I could know your background because I don't know how much of you are gonna be able to read these x-rays. Um, I'm not gonna really go into it, but like I've already talked about, we look for this black circle at the end it's not always a perfect circle at the tip. Sometimes it's a different shape and it extends further. Um, these are all my cases, by the way. Um, in this case in the middle, this is a bite wing. It looks a little different from your PA, your periapical radiograph. The bite wing shows you caries really well and also shows you the bone. You can see in this tooth, this is number 13. The cavity, by the time we remove it, that's this dark area here on both sides. One, it's going to be touching the nerve. so. Once you expose the nerve to the cavity, you need to do a root canal. Also, this is gonna be one of those scenarios where there's so much tooth structure missing that you'll wanna put that post in so that your dentist can restore it, the general dentist can restore it. So just looking at this one x-ray, basically, yes, this tooth needs a root canal. I treated this patient yesterday. Um, he's in zero pain, none at all. But really this tooth, if this cavity got any bigger, he very likely would start having pain um, and also, this tooth on the right, you can also see this cavity. I just don't want to uh, ignore it. It's not as close to the nerve. So right now, we're just watching that one. We might end up removing the cavity for him and then seeing if it touches. Um, usually, we'll have the general dentist do that, but we'll see. I'm going to skip this bottom one, but basically, this is what a root canal looks like in an x-ray. Um, we've probably seen them already. I can't remember. But this is a crown on top. It's a PFM crown, porcelain fused to metal. The metal is this radio, again, metal is always radio opaque, so it's this um, white. And then the, the, P, the porcelain, which is the more tooth color, is on the outside. Here we have the gutta percha, these canals, and they do have a post. So you can see how there's two different colors here. So that's the post um, surrounded by basically a filling material that you can kind of see over here. So not something to get too caught up on, but since we talked about it. And there is tons of bone loss here. It's that radiolucency we're talking about, that periapical radiolucency, the paro, like I've said. Um, it just doesn't always present like a circle. So that's why I included that again. Um, this is probably, again, just sort of over your overkill and something you don't need to know yet. But I want to just put it because I did mention retreatment. So this is a case um, I saw recently. So this is how do you know if a root canal is failing or if this was maybe there ahead of time? On the left, this was the tooth before the root canal. On the right, it's after. All I want you to look at is look at the apex, that end of the tooth. There's no big dark circle here. Five years later, look at the same x-ray. It looks a little different because the patient has had a crown since. Same x-ray, big circle, big radiolucency. So that means something is not quite right. So um, I'm gonna leave it at that, but that's just kind of an example of when we do a root canal and it fails and we have to do something else. In this case, you could either do the retreatment like I talked about or the surgery. Again, don't worry about it, but just recognize that's that change happened in five years um, in the same basically area. So, okay, I know that was so much. So let's get back into the fun stuff. Um, why did I choose endo? As you can probably tell, I love talking about it. Um, I don't think I'm the best at explaining it, 
per se. I, I'm just very chatty and I get off track. Um, but I think if you're if you like talking about something and you like teaching it, that does show that you like it. So um, I also had so when I was in dental school, the reason I even looked at endo was because one of the endo residents at the time, um, I just I knew her and she was a pleasure to be around. So I would just spend time with her. And then it turned into me shadowing her and then it turned into me never really leaving the endo department. And I would shadow other people and I really, um, I loved it. And I got closer with the faculty and I also shadowed some endodontists outside in private practice. And really after, I mean, after the first experience with just the residents, I sort of knew, but all those experiences together, again, solidified. I love endo, I love, yes, the science of it, but I like, for some reason, I think endo endodontists are the coolest people and all the people I've met, um, Residents, faculty, they're all just, I mean, the nicest, best people. So also I, I've said, I love taking care of patients in pain, very anxious and just totally doing a 180 on them. And a lot of my patients, I swear, fall asleep during the procedure. Um, and a lot of them leave smiling or laughing, or if I call them a few days later, they're out of pain. So that's the best feeling to me. One, it proves I have a reason to keep doing this procedure, but also it shows we're truly making an immediate difference um, that's another big thing about endo. When I treat a patient and I treat, I do the root canal, it's almost immediate treatment or a lot of other things in dentistry are not the same way. Um, I'm treating a disease that I, I mean, I'm not gonna say cure, but we sort of get rid of the disease. Also, I, I've said this, there's three main procedures. You get very comfortable even doing, um, I mean, even my residency, I've done about two years, a little one month under two years by now. I have done almost 200 root canals pretty much, I think. Um, all different teeth. And I feel, of course, I am nowhere close to done. I, I struggle every day and I learn something new every day, but you also get more comfortable every day. And a big part of dentistry is confidence. If you're not confident, your patient will know it. They're going to be nervous and it's going to just result in bad things. So if for you to, whatever you need to do to feel confident, for me, it's getting very good at one, two or three procedures. That's why I feel confident. And that's why I make my patients feel confident. Um, and I also got sort of interested in research um, so that's something maybe to look at in any specialty you're considering. Do you like, like, what are the current trends? What are the journals publishing in your field? And do you have any interest in that? Some more fun things. So this is an Instagram account that I absolutely love. She's in New York. Um, she just posts the coolest cases. I know this might look just like chaos to you, um, but to an end honest, these are really crazy cases, really cool results. This, I don't even know what's happening here. If this is real this is the whole pulp in one piece i have never pulled it out like this i pulled out just one of them so like cut it off here but even that is very infrequent it doesn't usually come out like this this beautiful so it just i mean it shows you how amazing she is so whatever you're doing i mean social media is like taking over so find inspiration um, i mean be careful you don't want to just just be careful who you follow always but largely using instagram or any social media for inspiration i think is only a positive thing also, just some fun technology. Um, so the microscope, it basically makes things super zoomed in. Everything we do in our endo or root canals is teeny tiny. So the microscope lets us really be in the tooth. I think of a, a picture at the end that kind of shows what it looks like through the microscope. It's, if you guys have seen loops or you've heard of loops, it is like loops on steroids. I have loops and compared to, I mean, I have, I have really zoomed in loops. I'm trying to think. I think I just got some that you can change the the magnification. I think it goes up to maybe five or whatever. I don't use them that frequently, but five or something. And the microscope is way, way more zoomed in. And then these are two other things. I'm not going to get into it. They're really like advanced. I mean, I, I'm barely learning about them, but we are using lasers um, in root canals, which is really cool. And also this, this thing called gentle wave. They're basically ways that we can be treating, treat the same disease, um, but in less invasive ways and in ways, in ways that um, have better outcomes. So just something to look forward uh, to in the future. And if you're interested in endo, definitely look them up. They're very cool. Um, some advice. So I don't know how much of you are interested in endo. So I am gonna skip this slide. When I was in dental school, I actually wrote this little article um, and I put a link, I don't know if you guys even have access to this. Um, I put a link here, but just Google, you can just Google my name, Jessica Rudman, endo residency. And I swear this is like the second thing that pops up. Um, moral of the story, and I'll leave it at this, is be confident in your decision. So whatever you decide you wanna to apply to, 
if that, if you know for sure that you want to do that, just do it. So I, for endo, I'll just, I have to get into it now because I can't help it. But for endo, a lot of people will tell you, you should get more experience. And having been in residency for two years, I agree. I mean, I am weaker than someone who's worked um, in practice or done a, an AGD. I'm, I was slower at the beginning and I have a weaker background in all those other areas other than root canals that they had an extra year doing. I can't do a crown prep um, really anymore. I've purposely blocked it out. Um, but other things, even fillings, I'm, I can do them now, of course, but at the beginning it's harder when you have less experience. So overall, they will people will advise you, do an extra year, do a AGD, do a GPR, and then apply. I knew I didn't want to do that, and I and I took the and I knew why, um, and I was prepared to be a little slower at the beginning and have a steeper learning curve. And I can tell you now, I don't regret my decision. I'm so happy I pursued it right away. And I have, in my opinion, I have caught up, and I think I'm where I would be if I did that extra year. Um, that being said, there are tons of benefits to doing an extra year, and maybe given another lifetime, I would have tried it, and I, I could tell you what I like better, but. Basically, I'm 27. I need to get out of school, so that's that's the end of that. So, I'm gonna also skip this, but these are really good tips on how to apply to end a residency. So, if you want to just like learn about programs or see what programs exist, you can just Google Idea Pass. It brings you find a search engine. I don't know. I don't remember how to get there, but type in Idea Pass search engine. Go to program type, hit endodontics, and I think you can leave it blank for the rest and hit select. It will give you a list of all the programs and you can scroll through that list. And if you get to one, it will say, for example, program requirements. And on the bottom here, it says whether or not they require private practice or that AGD or GPR. So basically, does it do they want you to do additional um, training before applying? That just shows you how big of a topic this is. So if it says highly recommended, that means it's not required and you will still get accepted. I My program, I'm pretty sure this is from my program, honestly. Um, I think they highly recommend it. They accepted me without it. So again, stay positive, stay confident in your decision. If you want to apply straight in and you see this, don't be scared. They don't say recommend, then you're, or they, I mean, sorry, they don't say required, you're good. Highly recommend is not the same thing as required. So just take a peek. Some of them will say required. And um, so don't waste your money applying on those. That is all I will say about that. If you want to learn more about endo, these are some ways. This is our journal. It's called the JOE or Journal of Endodontics. Through your college, you probably, I don't know if you have access to the journal, but you actually do. I know for a fact because I still steal some of my college's articles sometimes, but I don't have access. Um, you have access to certain articles uh, through just other search engines. So you can go to Google Scholar and type in maybe something about endodontics. Um, if it shows you it's on this journal, you can access it through your, your school. Again, I, I just made it so complicated, but find some way to look at articles if you can, just to see the current research. What are people studying and what is like in the future? Because of course, the specialty is always changing. This is a textbook I actually love. Um, I bought it in dental school, a hard copy. I haven't opened it really more than like once. Do not buy a hard copy unless you really want to. It's heavy and it's expensive. Your dental school 100% will have a copy online um, and they might even have a hard copy. You can use a hard copy online, that's all I use. And I like it because I can highlight it as I go. You can download it. Um, and it just makes it way easier to read. There is so much information in here. I would highly recommend it if you like endo. Okay, and then also, so when I was in dental school, um, I was a part of ASDA, which I highly recommend. I think ASDA is amazing. And I worked on the national magazine called, called Contour. Um, and that's actually, there's a blog associated with it. It's not Contour, it's, I, I forget what it is. It's been a while. Um, but there's a blog associated with ASDA and that's where I actually published that article. So go ahead and look at the blog, not just for endo, for anything. This, this would be great to read before getting into dental school, especially for interviews, there's tons of tips. So read this Contour magazine, it's online, it's free. Uh, I think it's free, it's free with an ASDA membership. As a pre-dental, I don't know, but hopefully. And then also this blog, blog is, I wanna say definitely free, but now I you know, can't remember anything. I think it's free. So if you can, just check it out. I think again, I've kind of like talked so much. Let's skip this, but when you're looking at jobs, I, I say skip, then I start talking, I can't help it. Um, my patients can't talk to me all day, so I just, I'm happy to talk to anyone, including myself. So when you look at a job, there's lots of things to consider. Corporate is so big right now. 
The only thing I would say is there's a big difference between certain different certain corporate companies. So we all know Aspen, or you, you probably know Aspen. I'm not going to say anything about it, but it's very different than other things. So um, these are two corporate endo specific companies. So it's U.S. Endo Partners and Endo uh, Endo One Partners, and I know people who work at both, so I feel comfortable, um, you know, putting these here. I'm not saying anything about corporate, but I know the people who work these practices are happy. Um, so corporate is not always a bad thing. Um, it has a bad stigma. Sometimes you'll kind of hear. I would say keep an open mind and really just judge each one separately. And um, I think you'll keep a lot of options open that way. Something else to consider before applying even, it's good to know, do you want to own a practice one day? Because you, you might do things differently. Um, and that can change. I always thought I would want to own a practice. Now I honestly don't know. Um, I just want to work, get experience, uh, make some money, make it, have a family, all that. So owning a practice is sort of becoming a secondary goal. Um, or if you want to specialize in endodontics or in something else, are there a lot of general dentists in the area and are they doing your procedures? If I go to an area and there's really not a lot of specialists or not, not a lot of endodontists and the general dentists are used to doing their own root canals, I mean, I don't know if I come to town, are they going to even send them to me? They might, because they might be sick of doing them. They also might be so comfortable doing them, they want to keep doing them. So then I'm going to have trouble getting referrals. So it leaves me here. Um, for any specialty, basically, you, ref you rely on referrals. So that can come in a lot of different ways. But basically, you need someone to put the patient in your chair. So know if you're going to be able to get referrals. Um, is there a lot of competition? Is your general dentist, is the general dentist going to have 10 different options of endodontists they can send their patient to? And how are you going to be different? So, excuse me, again, very early on to think about this. But if you are like, you're sat in your hometown, you love it. Um, you can't imagine living anywhere else. Start thinking about these questions because it may change what you pursue and what you choose to do. Um, so I am very excited to say I have a job um, set up for when I graduate. I graduate end of September and I'll be joining um, It's Essential Endodontics. Dr. Yelton um, has nine practices and they're all, he's, um, him and his associates, I'll be one of his associates, perform all those, those procedures, like I said, root canals, retreatment and surgery at, at these different locations. Um, I am so excited he's the best. I know people who work for him and speak so highly of him. I am so excited. So yay, that's my future. And I put some of my cases here. Again, I'm just, I get too excited. I'll just leave them. Really, I'm not going to talk about myself and you probably won't even really appreciate, understand them yet, but just for fun, um, just some cool cases. This is really cool because if you guys know, uh, maxillary molars usually have three roots. And then this tooth, the two buckle roots were fused into one. So you can kind of see it looks sort of funny. Um, just a cool case. And that was my finish. Things that, And that was so, again, I really should stop, but I get so excited. This, there, I left a space here and that that is a space for a post that we talked about just to kind of bring all the ideas back. Um, I'm going to skip this, but sometimes we do... Um, we don't do a root canal all on the same day. Sometimes for due to time reasons, due to symptoms, if a patient has an abscess that's draining, we will put a medicine in the tooth. That's what you see here. Um, we'll bring the patient back and we'll finish it another day. The only reason I bring this up is sometimes you might see something like this um, while you're shadowing. And then basically it's the medicine in the tooth. It's called calcium hydroxide. It's not a finished root canal. So. Um, this is a case where I redid a root canal. So the initial root canal had this, see this dark, dark area at the bottom. That's that radiolucency we were talking about. Um, and I know it's hard to tell the difference, but you can see here, my root canal ended here. Theirs ended here. Something we look at for root canals is we want it to end pretty close to this apex. So I changed that. And I also made, you know, some other changes, but just an example. This is a surgery case. Um, I'm going to skip it, but basically see how the root here uh, I, cut, I basically cut this root. So the root used to be more um, similar to this one. If you look at this x-ray, look how much shorter it got. It's because I cut half that root to get rid of all this black area here. Sometimes we do two at a time. This was my first time I did this recently. I did two master molars in the same appointment. I was so tired, um, but very awesome to do for our patients. And then this was my case today. I had to include it because I am so excited. Um, 
basically what I, what you see here only happens 6% of the time. Usually this tooth has two nerves. That's the sim simplicity of it. It's a maxillary first uh, premolar number five, usually has two nerves. In this case, it had three nerves, which again, only happens 6% of the time. My first time ever seeing a tooth like this. Um, it does happen. I've seen other people's cases, but it's my first time. So when I opened the tooth, this has got a percha, it's that pink. Pretend this, this other one on the right, or the patient's left, so I literally get so confused. But on your right, see, pretend this isn't here. That's how it started. And then I kind of felt like this was located a little too far to this side. So I just looked, I was like, you know what? Sometimes it's there. Let me just look a little to the right. And it was right there and I found it. And if I had left it, I would have left tissue and potentially bacteria inside. Um, this tooth was alive. So actually there was no bacteria, but over time bacteria can colonize that space. You can tell I'm such an endo nerd, but this was a very cool case. I sent it to my dad, who's a dentist instantly. Um, once you get into dentistry, you'll learn sort of the really cool things. And in my world, this is as cool as it gets, at least for me. So that is it. Thank you so much for letting me nerd out on endo. I know that was long, um, but yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Please DM me on Instagram, follow me or whatever. You don't have to follow me. I'm old and um, my content is boring, but you can email me. This is my school email. This is my personal email. My school's actually better, but because I'm graduating in September, I don't know how long I'll have access to it. So if you're gonna email me for any reason after September, 2022, use my personal email. Um, but yeah, that is it. I'm happy to take any questions or you can, uh, yeah. Yeah, first off, thank you so much, Dr. Redmond. That was amazing. I mean, I was listening the whole time and I was okay. honestly, I was so, I don't think I've ever had a perspective on endo like that before. So I appreciate that. I'm obsessed with it. It's so bad. I'm obsessed. I mean, you're obsessed. I'm like, I can see your passion. I stare at my x-rays sometimes and like someone will come over like, why are you staring at your phone? I'm literally looking at my own x-ray because I think it's so cool. So I'm so glad. No. Yeah. Honestly, you just showed me like endo in a different light. Like I wouldn't yeah, yeah. even thought about endo ever, even though I'm pre-dental, I don't need to. We but just follow like, some Instagram accounts because it will, it will, yeah. Yeah, honestly, I will follow you. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, but follow the other one I put, follow her. She's really cool okay. too. Oh, no, I searched her up when you posted it. I oh, searched she's her so, page. She's so yeah. cute. Yeah. <laughs> um, really okay. cool, so she's cute. Thank you. So we have like um, like eight minutes for questions. So I will definitely ask you some questions, even though you did hit a bunch of stuff. So if I do repeat, my bad. Um, but I guess we can kind of start off like in your college days, kind of like what kind of extracurriculars did you do? And maybe even talk about the DAT if you like remember. I don't know yeah. how long that was, but stuff like that. I purposely blocked out the DAT. <laughs> Just kidding. Honestly, it wasn't that bad. Um, yeah, so college, so I swam at the beginning competitively. It was a D3 school that took up a lot of my time. And I do think, I mean, do not just become an athlete. It's like, you know, working out is awful, but if you're an athlete, that is huge. I think it, one just builds like incredible skills, time management alone. Um, but if you're an athlete, I mean, or want to do a club sport, I definitely think that always looks good. A lot of people in dental school, I know we're athletic. Um, it's okay if you're not. Um, I know a lot of people are artistic and did um, things like that. Definitely just any clubs. I Some regrets I have. I want to do college all over again um, because I, I didn't have enough time, but I wish I had done more on writing. Um, really, moral of the story, find something you're passionate about and you might not have time to do later. I'm writing research papers now, and honestly, I like it because I miss writing, which is like, so, that's very sad to say. But do all the things that you like. Don't necessarily do things that you think the um, whoever's reading your application is gonna wanna see. They will see your passion, just like you guys are hopefully seeing mine. You can talk about really anything. I'm trying to think of a like crazy hobby, but my brain is fried. Anything you do as an extracurricular or hobby, if you talk about it in a passionate way, that's all you have to do. Um, don't just study, you have to do something else. I, I really believe that. Um, find anything, but doesn't matter what it is. Have it show some, you have to be able to talk about it passionately, passionately, um, and also have it ideally show some sort of skill, show that you're artistic, you're good with your hands, that you can time manage, that you have leadership, anything like that. DAT. Um, I took it twice. Um, I took it once my after my second year. I honestly don't remember why. I think because I had just taken all these courses for some reason, like all my courses that they were going to test me on. So I, except for maybe some of them that I thought I could teach myself, 
I don't know, but I took it too early and I, I don't regret taking it because it was just money and it was early enough I could retake it. And it got me that testing experience and got the nerves out of the way. Um, but the second time around, I was so much more pre- prepared. I did so much better. Um, I'll tell you my scores. So I don't care about them anymore. They were like 21 basically around, which I don't think is anything super. I mean, I think it's impressive because I'm not a test taker. People in my school would, you know, brag at my dental school would brag about it. They talk about their scores. I have to tell you, your scores get you into dental school and then they mean nothing. And that is a good thing. Everything you do, just keep that in mind. It is so important. You have to do well. You get into dental school, you will forget your DIT score. If you ask me my college GPA, I don't know it. Those things are not important later, but they are important now. So study as much as you can. I think I did six weeks nonstop, um, like essentially seven days a week. Um, It was pretty painful, but it was better. I wanted to have my whole summer to like live my life. So I did that at the beginning of the summer. You can also study over a longer period of time, whatever you like. God bless you, but you'll get through it. It's not that bad. Do a ton of practice questions. Um, I would say really last piece of advice, try not to take it until you've taken all those courses. If you haven't taken um, organic chemistry yet or whatever, don't take the DIT yet. I don't even know if that's possible. I kind of think you can take it whenever you want, but again, just make sure you've taken all those courses so you're, you're as prepared as possible. And if you get a bad score, hopefully you took it early enough, you can retake it. Um, or you can also call the school and ask them, will you accept, accept someone with this score? So that is a long answer, but yes. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Um, next question, I was going to kind of shift now to like your residency and kind of like a day in your life. Like, do you go to classes? Are you yeah. like in clinic? Like how does residency work for like an end of resident? Yeah. So for me, I meant to put it too, but I, I lost track of time. Um, so it's very different. So mine is two, we'll say just two-ish years. Other programs are three, but less common. So for me, um, I'll just talk specifically about my, about my program. We do classes throughout. Um, the first year you take biomedical classes. So you're taking like oral pathology, biostatistics, um, Wow, I blocked it out already, but things like that. Oh, anatomy and physiology, things I've already, you've already taken just in a really condensed fashion. Um, and you take it with other specialties. So you took, I took it with like perio residents, oral surgery residents, things like that. Everyone's taking it. Um, I also have endo specific classes where we basically, endo is big on literature. So we read classic literature that explains why we do what we do. Um, and we also read current literature that also makes us think differently. Um, so for example, there's current literature on like those technologies I put, um, on there. That's actually really interesting. If we're going back to my case, there's, we read literature about how common is it that that occurs. And again, I'm excited to tell you 6% of the time. So yeah, you're reading articles, you're reading research, but it's, you can apply it to your life and it becomes fun. Um, and you are in clinic the whole time. It just depends on the class schedule. Now is the second year. I am only in class two half days a week like we think um, Friday morning and Tuesday morning, the rest of them in clinic treating patients in the summer, summer for us is six weeks and we're, we're only in clinic. So right now we're in summer. Um, so five days a week, patients the whole time. Um, it's up to you. What, this is what I love about my program. It's up to you how many patients you want to see. I see two patients a session right now. Um, I mean, not always. I mean, in the summer, people are going to bail and go to the beach or in the winter, it's cold and icy. They don't come. But when the schedule allows, I can do two patients a session. So that's like two hours each, which is pretty standard, I think. Um, I hope no one bursts my bubble, but I think two hours is standard for residency. So yeah, that's my basic life. And then we do like lunch and learns and we do dinner and learns still. So you'll do those in dental school, but we have companies come and take us out to dinner and talk to us um, about products. And like those two um, corporate companies I talked about, they'll come and tell us a little bit more and that's why I just urge you to keep an open mind. Not all corporates the same. So you go to these these dinner and learns or these lunch and learns and you get a different perspective. So that's why it's important to always keep an open mind and be well-rounded. Um, I can talk for days, as you can tell. So No, no. Thank you. That was talk to myself all day long while I while my patients there. So I'm just happy to have someone to look at. Oh no, no, no. you're so good. Thank you. Um, but yeah, we're basically eight and i know you probably had like a long day so i will conclude like our question answers but it was 
wonderful. And so is the presentation. So once Thank again, you so much. Please guys, email me or if you um, reach out to me on Instagram, email is better only because I literally put things in a tab, like a yeah. folder the second I read it. So if I don't put it in the tab, I will not lose it. Yeah. Instagram, I could lose you, but also if that's easier, that's fine. Um, but I will get back to you and just do it again if I don't answer you. It's, it's not on purpose. Thank you so much. So yeah. Good. Yeah. Good luck, everybody. And thank you so much, Dr. Rudman. Yeah, of course. Thank you.